Skeleton of the upper limb, the humerus. The humerus, or arm bone, is one of the typical examples of what the long bone should actually look like. It has the long and massive shaft or diaphysis of the bone, coupled with both distal and proximal ends or epiphysis of this bone. The proximal end of the humerus. This bone is also the right-sided bone and when we take a closer look we'll find out the round huge area of the humerus which is simply named the head of the bone. In anatomy term the head or the caput is really used to identify large and rounded part of the bone and it does not necessarily have to be on the most proximal part of it. The head of the humerus is separated from the rest of the humeral shaft by shallow groove and that groove that goes circumferentially 300 degrees around the head of the humerus is known as the anatomical neck of the bone. When we take a closer look and we rotate the bone we'll find out that proximal humerus has two projections one which is directed anteriorly and it is known as the tubercle minor or tubercle minus and then the one which is oriented strictly laterally and it is known as the major tubercle, tubercle maeus. On the proximal end of the humerus or we can also say the superior end of the humerus the difference is that terms proximal and distal in anatomy usually denote orientation of the bone towards the rest of the skeleton, of the axial skeleton or the body itself. So part of the bone which is closer to the attachment of the bone or limb to the trunk is known as proximal and the one which is further distant and away from the trunk is known as the distal end of the bone. On the proximal humerus one can see as its most prominent feature quite large and rounded head of the humerus. The term caput or head in anatomy is always used to identify a rounded projection of the bone rather than to be immediately identified as the superior most landmark of the bone. The head of the humerus is separated from rest of the bone by 360 degrees running all the way around shallow groove that is named anatomical neck of the humerus. Further distal from the anatomical neck of the humerus where the proximal epiphysis meets the shaft, humerus offers two massive projections. The minor tubercle that is oriented anteriorly and further behind the major tubercle that has the orientation laterally. Between those two tubercles one can easily identify the groove which is known as the intertubercular groove. This area is of interest for us because it will allow the tendon of the long head of the biceps brachii muscle to pass between two tubercles to go over the glenohumeral joint and to attach itself onto supraglenoid tubercle of the scapula. The intertubercular groove is very clearly marked by presence of major and minor tubercles. However, if we follow it further distally, we'll find out that the groove is not only present between two tubercles, but it is also present between their respective crests or ridges. Each of the two tubercles will project bone further down and there will be two additional ridges the ridge or the crest of the minor tubercle and then the ridge or the crest of the major tubercle helping us identify bicipital groove even better. Terms bicipital and intertubercular groove are used interchangeably. 
When we say intertubercular groove, it is anatomically very accurate. When we say bicipital groove, it really means that we need to know that the content of this groove is the biceps brachii muscle with its long head and its tendon. Those two crests of the lesser and greater tubercles, as they mark the presence of intertubercular canal over the shaft of the humerus, are also sometimes referred to as the lip of the bicipital groove. So this lip would be the medial lip of the bicipital groove, which belongs to the lesser tubercle, and the other one will be the lip of the greater tubercle or the lateral lip of the bicipital groove. So as I said, these terms are used interchangeably. You can either call it the crest of the lesser tubercle or the medial lip of the bicipital groove. If we take the bone into our hands and rotate it so that we start seeing more of its posterior aspect, there will be one interesting large landmark and the other one that might be more difficult to identify. Let's start with the large one. Approximately at the middle third of the humeral shaft, there is a V-shaped massive landmark that is called the deltoid tuberosity. It is marking insertion point of the deltoid muscle, the one which covers superficially all other muscles of the shoulder joint. The other one, which is much more difficult to identify, is a bit of a groove which passes also across the posterior aspect of the bone. In order to see it better, one will have to keep rotating the bone and allow the light to identify this landmark a little bit better. The groove that we are able to see as it passes over a posterior aspect of the humerus running from superior medial to inferior and lateral direction is known as the spiral groove which is also the sulcus of the radial nerve. The radial nerve runs like this across the posterior humeral shaft in order to reach the distal lateral side of the elbow. The distal humerus. Interestingly enough on the shaft of the bone other than deltoid tuberosity and groove of the radial nerve we could not find too many anatomically relevant details. That is not the case on the distal end. As one can see distal shaft start massively expanding towards medial and lateral side of the elbow. It is no surprise because a single bone of the arm, as the humerus is, will need to make joint with two bones of the forearm, the ulna and the radius. Ulna is the medial bone of the forearm, whereas the radius is having lateral position. In order to accommodate formation of the elbow joint, between humerus, radius and ulna, there will be two different articular surfaces to be formed on the distal humerus. One which is oriented laterally, which is rounded, is known as the capitulum. The term capitulum could be translated into English as the small head. The other articular surface is somewhat shaped like a pulley, which is exactly what its name in Latin would be. It's known as the trochlea of the humerus. This is the capitulum, this is the trochlea of the humerus. Above the trochlea, as well as above the capitulum, there are two distinctly indented areas. One above the capitulum is known as the radial fossa. One above the trochlea is known as the coronoid fossa. Both fossae will accommodate position of ulna and radius during full flexion of the elbow. The head of the radius is going to fit into its own fossa and the coracoid process of the ulna is going to fit here into its own depression. If we go all the way to the medial 
or to the lateral side of the humerus, one can identify and also palpate on own elbow two most prominent points that the humerus makes at the elbow joint. They are known as the medial and the lateral epicondyles. Both epicondyles are interesting because they offer enough bone surface for attachment of multiple muscles that will cross the elbow joint and go over the forearm. It is traditionally known that medial epicondyle of the humerus will become attachment point for common flexor tendon. That is a group of muscles on the anterior forearm that will have flexion as their common function. On the lateral side, the lateral epicondyle also becomes a site for attachment of common extensor tendon. That is a group of muscles that will be located on the posterior forearm and the common function is going to be extension. Now we need to see what the distal humerus looks like if we see it from posterior direction. As one can see it right away, there is a huge articular surface that we already recognize as the trochlea that is visible. This is now the medial epicondyle, this is the lateral epicondyle. Superior to the trochlea, on the posterior side of the bone, there is even larger depression. This time it is known as the olecranon fossa. Part of the ulna, which is called the olecranon, will fit into its fossa during full extension of the elbow joint. One can also see that there is no capitulum further lateral to the trochlea. Simple fact is that the radius in elbow extension does not need to make a contact and there is no need to establish greater surface that would extend over to the posterior aspect of the bone. Capitulum, as we can see it here, will make the contact as the radius goes from elbows full extension into full flexion, but there is no need for further continuation backwards of the capitulum. Finally, what is known and traditionally referred to as the funny bone, there is a bit of a groove on the medial distal end of the humerus. The groove itself is known as the sulcus nervi ulnaris. This is one of the most important nerves of the upper limb. It goes from medial side of the arm passes posterior to the medial epicondyle of the humerus and then wraps itself around it, practically getting around the bone at this very location. That is sulcus nervi ulnaris.